Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, my name is Sarah Kelly. I'm the executive director of the Boston Preservation Alliance. If you're not familiar with the Alliance, we are the primary historic preservation advocacy and education nonprofit here in Boston. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we are thrilled to be here tonight, and I want to first thank our hosts, uh, the Old South Meeting House. Emily Curran is here, um, who helped set this up this evening. Um, they're a really important partner of ours, and we love uh, doing programs with them. They have a lot of other great programs going on, including a lunchtime series on uh, the history of Boston neighborhoods right now. So if you're free and in the area during lunchtime, come check those out as well. We are also really excited to be partnering with um, Union Park Press. Um, this uh, is the first event we've done with them, but hopefully not the last. Um, and uh, they are publishers of some really interesting um, books that relate to the history and the culture and uh, uh, all sorts of activities having to do with uh, especially uh, New the New England area. Um, and they have a number of books that relate to Boston, including this one. Uh, Meg Muckenhaupt, who um, is our featured speaker tonight, is going to talk to you about uh, Boston's uh, gardens and green spaces. And her uh, presentation is uh, an outgrowth of a book that she's re recently published, which uh, you will be able to um, purchase and uh, have signed after the event. And um, the, you know, the reason why we wanted to invite uh, Meg to speak tonight um, is because in looking at her book and um, uh, spending some time uh, reading about the spaces that she features, um, we really felt strongly that it's closely correlated to the work that we do at the Preservation Alliance. Um, so much of the work we do is uh, about uh, protecting and restoring, and in some cases improving, um, historic places in the city. And a lot of those, um, we, you know, we often first think about buildings um, as the work that we do in preservation, but a lot of the work that we do also relates uh, to parks and open spaces. It wasn't that long ago when there was a proposal to uh, temporarily, you may remember this, you may have read about it in the Globe, um, temporarily reroute Sturro Drive um, through the, um, the Charles River Esplanade. And this was going to be done um, while construction was uh, taking place uh, on the road. And it was one of several options of a way to get the road project done. And um, immediately, um, our phone started ringing off the hook from people all over the city saying, wait a minute, we don't want to go you know, five years or more, potentially, because we know how these projects sometimes work, um, without being able to enjoy um, this uh, a tremendous uh, resource, um, which is uh, appreciated by people all over the city and um, certainly pe visitors from all over the world. Um, that was the inspiration for us to work with residents of Boston to petition the park for landmark designation. And um, we were successful in that effort. It was the most supported landmark petition, um, we think possibly ever, um, in the city with over 800 signatures. And um, you know that's the kind of uh, passion, I think, that Bostonians have for our historic places. We were successful in landmarking the park. We were successful in preventing uh, the road from uh, being rerouted through the park for that period, and uh, the agency that was um, you know, working on uh, repairing the, uh, the roadway uh, found another way to get it done. Not surprisingly, we, we kind of knew they could, <laughs> but um, maybe they just needed a little push in that direction. So um, in our mind, I think that's um, a lot of what Meg's book is about as well. You know, how do we allow our historic parks and open spaces, how do we make sure that they're protected, the important things that we care about are protected, uh, but how do we also allow them to remain vibrant and evolve and, um, and change over time? And I think the places that she features really strike that balance between um, you know, preserving uh, what's important about them uh, from the past, uh, but also uh, they're, they're places that are really vibrant today and they've, they've um, I think they've, they've been able to change and evolve as well. So um, it's wonderful to have her here um, to speak about that to us. And it's really inspiration, I think, for all the work that we do. Um, so we, we really appreciate it. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Meg. Thank you. I have my own mic. Oh, OK. <laughs> Give it to me. All right. This is off now. 
Hi. Good evening. I am Meg Muckenhaupt, author of Boston Gardens and Green Spaces, and this talk is going to have three basic parts. Um, the first, the shape of our city. I'm going to talk about some of the larger geologic forces that affected where we put parks. The second part, the lay of the land. I'm going to talk about, in the Emerald Necklace, why most of those parks exist. Why do we have them there? Boston Common. Boston, a city, you have buildings, you have people living close together, trading information, buying and selling things, worshiping together, starting wars. Why do you need a field in the middle of the city? What's the point? I'll talk about what the point is and why that happens. Um, part three, hangings, health, and horticulture. I'm going to talk a little bit about why parks were founded back then, 1630, 1830, and why some parks have emerged in Boston over the past couple of decades, the differences between those parks, and some ways that they're similar. People use land a little bit differently from the way they did in 1630, and we're going to talk about how. Uh, but first, before I begin this talk, I need to say something very important, which is that I do like parks. This came up because in one of my earliest talks, a kind woman uh, came up to me afterwards and said, you're not from here, are you? And you know you're going to have a bad conversation when somebody comes and asks you if you were from Boston, and the answer is no. I grew up in New Jersey through no fault of my own until I was age 16, and the woman replied, well, some of us grew up here with these parks, and we love them very much, and I don't think you're being very respectful. So let me just say, I respect Boston's green space. I wrote my book because I was having problems finding information about different green space because some of it is owned by the city, some is owned by the state, some is owned by Mass Audubon, some is owned by the trustees of reservations, some of it is conservation land belonging to town. I wanted to bring things together and let people know about some of the amazing places in the city that have developed over the years. Um, but we are going to talk about raw sewage. We are going to talk about open graves with rotting corpses in them very briefly, but they are part of why Boston has the parks it does. So one of my messages is that parks reflect the totality of human experience, not just the nice pretty flower smelling, but other things people do. And when you're designing parks and thinking about parks, you kind of have to take that into account. And with little ado, let's look at an image of the public garden 15,000 years ago, please Shelby. Uh, this is what it looked like and where you could ride on the swan boats. There we go. The point being, 15,000 years ago, the Boston Public Garden was under a gigantic sheet of ice about a mile thick. Next, please. It looked kind of like this, and if you want to see, that's about where I grew up in New Jersey, down beyond the glaciers, so studying geology was a lot more complicated when I was in grade school than it is for Boston kids who can, whoa, sorry about that who can just blame things on glaciers. Why is this important to Boston Parks? Because, next please. Um, wait a minute, there should be another slide here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. No, it isn't there. Okay, back up, back, 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 back. Something happened between my home and here. Boston is a pile of glacial refuse, basically. When the glaciers retreated, they left behind piles of sand, of rock. Some of that became our Boston Harbor Islands. This, they are all what are called drumlins, distinctively shaped hills. They look like a whale, they've got a big end, and they've got a very long tail end. A great Brewster Island is a great looking drumlin. Boston has the only drowned drumlin field in the Northeast. But more importantly, what this meant is that water drained very well from the top of Boston's hills, Beacon Hill, Mount Vernon, Mount Pemberton, which you don't hear much about nowadays, and we'll talk about that, and pooled at the bases. This was not true over in Charlestown. Your local neighborhood Puritans arrived in Charlestown first before they came over to what was then the Shawmut Peninsula, which is now Boston, and they had a problem. They didn't have enough drinking water. I don't know if it's because salt water crept into the groundwater there, Maybe it was fouled by animals or human waste. I don't know. But what happened is they needed water. They came over to the Shawmut Peninsula to one, oh, what was his name? Reverend Blackston, who had moved up here to escape a bunch of Puritans who had settled in Weymouth. He decided to strike out on his own in a true American fashion. Puritans came over and said, can we settle here? He said, sure. And he moved out to Providence, where the Blackstone River was named after him. And so the Puritans had drinking water. Supposedly this drinking water came just down the street here from Spring Lane, which is next to Water Street, 
And if you go there on a summer afternoon, you'll see somebody in a tri-corner hat leading a tour to the plaque of Reverend Blackstone. Next, please. Um, another effect of having glaciers around here, apart from having people settle in Boston, in the Shawmut Peninsula, is we have lots of glacial kettle hole lakes, which make parks for us, such as, next one, Walden Pond, and next, Jamaica Pond, and Fresh Pond in Cambridge. All lovely looking lakes. Next, please. This is the quote I was looking for, which got reshuffled at some point. The Puritans settled at the base of Beacon Hill because it is made of stratified sand from the glacial outwash channel. The layered deposits allow groundwater to flow and pool at the base, where the settlers could collect it for drinking water. In other words, you go to the beach, you pour water on sand, it comes right through. Ta-da, drinking water. Next, please. This is a map of what Boston looked like in about 1777, Shawmut Peninsula, and there's, there's my laser tool. About here is where the water originally was. Here is the Boston Common. Here are three mountains, Mount uh, Beacon Hill, Mount Pemberton, and Mount Vernon. Next, please. And here's just another view of the public garden, just to refer back to it. As you can see, in 1600, the public garden was underwater. These are mud flats. These are what are called, well, they aren't really mud flats per se. They're what you might call a wet meadow, which means it's grown over with salt tolerant grasses and plants, things like salt meadow cord grass, maybe some samphire, seaside goldenrod, seaside lavender. And every couple of weeks, when you have especially high tide, the water comes up and washes over and then goes out again. There are records of the earliest settlers um, harvesting hay to feed their cattle from this area. Next, please. And this is a map from a book called Mapping Boston by MIT Press. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say over the next couple of minutes, I really owe to that book and a book by Nancy C. Scholes called Gaining Ground. And if you want to know what was filled in where in Boston at any given time, Oh my God, the book tells you everything. And the answer is a lot of Boston is fill. What this shows you, since you may not be able to see the different colors here, is this darkest part is the original landmass that the European settlers would have found in 1630. These sort of slightly lighter green areas are what we would call freelance landfilling. You know, sort of thing that happens when someone owns a wharf and they decided they need a little bit more room, a little bit more space, make some more money, set up some more places to unload and load things. And what you do is you start throwing garbage off the end of your wharf. You throw gravel if you have it, you throw tea kettles, you throw beer bottles, whatever you have in there just to build up some fill on these mud flats, get a little bit more area out there. After that, what you get is large scale landfilling, area around North Station, the Back Bay, um, around South Boston. I really like the fact that uh, Castle Island was actually an island up until the 20th century. And now it's just Castle Peninsula. Um, Noddles Island and things up here. And these are large projects making acres of land, you know, doubling the size of Boston proper and of South Boston in particular. Next, please. And here's one place that the fill came from. Um, this was the supposed, well, this is really a, a idea of what the skyline of Boston must have looked like when the settlers arrived, complete with the hostile natives shooting arrows at them as they peaceably float along in their boats. Doesn't look much like the Boston skyline now, does it? We don't look off from the Charles River and see those beautiful hills. Next, please. There's a reason for that. This is Beacon Hill in 1811. And these are the people carting off the top of Beacon Hill, which used to be about 100 feet higher than it is now. Um, it was carted off. There, the um, current monument that looks like that in Beacon Hill is actually a reproduction, I believe from 1876. There was a large storm, it fell down. They put up another one. We do that in Boston a lot. Um, high places were not valuable. You know, nowadays people like to have views. You like to live on top of the mountains. You can look down across Brookline or Jamaica Plain or someplace like that. When you're talking about people living in Boston in 1810, uh, high land was not very valuable. Only two types of people lived up there. You had to be very poor when you couldn't afford to live anywhere else, or very rich, and you could afford to hire all those poor people to cart everything uphill. I mean, can you imagine going, living at the top of Beacon Hill in 1810 during the winter? No cars. Everything has to be brought up by sleigh, up a steep hill by horses, or by people carrying it. Not a fun place to be. Um, and as I'm sure you all, you're all aware, one of the first uh, free African-American settlements in Boston was on the side of Beacon Hill.
before they took it apart. Next, please. Um, the question is, why did people take apart the hills in Boston and fill in the flats? You know, we have hundreds of miles of coastline in Boston. We have 3,000 miles of continents stretching behind us. Why did people think of this? Why did they do it? Why did they fill in this land, some of which became our future parts? Um, one of them is money. Boston's population grew extremely rapidly between 1790 and 1810 and kept on growing. Uh, doubling and doubling. By um, 1840, you had about 90,000 people here. Kept getting bigger. They needed some place to live. They needed some place to work. Next, please. Railroads. When you started having railroads in the 1830, one of the reasons we had railroads arriving in Boston was to bring in gravel from Needham to fill in the back bay. We'll get to that in a little bit. But um, railroads need places to unload. They need depots. They need places for trains to come in, places to put goods. And a lot of the area around North Station now was filled in by railroads. Uh, railroads also had a not terribly healthy effect on the local waterways. Remember I told you we'd be talking about raw sewage? This is part of that. Um, the Charles River before 1910 was tidal. That's one reason why we had those salt marshes by the Back Bay, because tides would come up the Charles River every day and come in and out. People depended on those tides to take away waste from nearby Boston. Boston didn't have central sewers going out into the harbor until 1870. There were a lot of people living in Boston by then. Before that time, there were a lot of what you might call freelance sewers coming out from under the city. Um, they'd go from streets, residences, out to whatever local waterway happened to be nearest, which was often the Charles River, which was tidal. The problem is, when the people started building dams and railroads across the river, they started blocking the tides. Particularly, they started blocking the tides from the area around Back Bay. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. After we talk about the Irish. Boston has a population of about 90,000 in 1840. In 1849 alone, close to 40,000 Irish people arrive in Boston. They don't all stay here. But Bostonians in that area were getting a little bit nervous about the Puritan stock and who was going to have power in Boston, and basically what you might call white Anglo-Saxon flight. There were lots of Irish people in Boston. There were fears that anyone who had wealth, anyone who was one of the, the culture that founded America, in a racist sort of way of thinking about it, was going to leave town. They needed more land where the proper sort of people who had power and money would want to live so they could stay in Boston and keep electing mayors. This is the story, part of the story of how the Back Bay was filled in, specifically to give a place for people to have good houses and live in a nice neighborhood where they wouldn't be bothered by these people. Of course, by 1878, Boston had elected an Irish mayor anyway, and this whole plan to preserve Yankee stock was, had failed. By 1876, only one in three people living in Boston was descended from the Puritans, but it was a motivation. It was an idea. Next, please. The smell. We talked about this a moment ago with the railroads. We're going to talk about it a little bit more just now. Um, 1820, somebody had the bright idea of building the Roxbury Mill Dam. This extended about where Beacon Street is now across that back bay area, which was filled in in the 1850s onward. And it was supposed to harness the power of the tides to make Boston even more of an industrial power force than it already was, except that Boston's real money came from things like trading, not manufacturing, and the power of the tides coming in the Charles River wasn't all that powerful, and the project basically failed but not before it blocked off all the tidal scour that would have come to the Back Bay area and the area where the public garden is now. So remember when I talked about those freelance sewers letting all sorts of st stuff come out there? Not flush toilets, those didn't come to Boston until 1850, but you know, stuff from the street, there might be some manure out there, scraps, whatever was lying around would get flushed out to these tidal flats and these sewers and stay there. And it didn't smell good. Here's a little quote from 1849, about the condition of the Back Bay. It was a body of water so foul that even clams and eels cannot live in it, and that no one will go within half a mile of in the summer unless from necessity, so great a stench arising therefrom. This was a huge motivation for filling in land, was just to push all that smelly stuff a little bit farther away. If you don't have mud flats, they don't smell anymore. Next, please. What does this have to do with parks? Everything. And now we will proceed to part two of the PDF, which Helpful Shelby will cause to appear in a moment. 
Yes, part two. All right, next slide, please. We're going to go around the emerald necklace a bit now. Oh, very fancy. Okay, next, please. So, let's start with the Boston Common. We talked about people coming, the Puritans coming to Boston so that they had water. They, uh, Boston was also a useful place because it had a nice harbor around it. This is the side towards the harbor. This is turned sideways. Um, north is this way, south is that way. It's not the way you usually see maps of Boston, just to label things a little bit better. This side is the Charles River side. It's not as important. You can't see ships coming from the harbor that way. You can't do trading over there because the ships can't make it up the Charles River. Over here is the water. Over here are all the great hills of mountainous Boston at the time. Here's another mill pond. This is your one large piece of flat area where you could take your cows because you don't want to come up anywhere along the harbor because that's where your starting business is. Those are your trading areas. Those are important. You don't want to just have a bunch of cows lying around there. Over here, you have to go up and around these mountains to get anywhere. You don't want to take your cows over here. This, you can just give them a drink of water in the morning, take them right over the common, and let them chew, and it's a lovely place. This is why we have the Boston Common where it is, basically. Oh, one word about the Boston Common, established by group agreement of the Puritan settlers, 1634. But you've probably heard of the tragedy of the commons, the idea if you, everybody owns a resource together and no one is individually responsible for it, then nobody will take care of it and everybody will use it up selfishly and it'll fall apart. This did not happen in the Boston Common. It was successfully grazed for 200 years until the mayor of Boston then decided that it was stupid to have pasturage for just 80 cattle in a city of 40,000 people. They, it was the triumph of environmental regulation. The common, each family, was limited to either four sheep or one milk cow, and it had to be a productive milk cow because these were Puritans. You couldn't have just nice old bossy you kept as a pet. It had to make milk, useful cow, or Elder Oliver's horse, who somehow was special. And that's all that was allowed on the common, just 80 animals. And it went on producing animals who produced milk or wool or mutton, if you really wanted to eat that, for 200 years. This is not the tragedy of the commons at all. But like I said, having a site set aside for 80 animals in a city of 40,000 people was a little bit silly by 1830. Okay, next please. This is just the same illustration turned north-south as usual. And again, you can see where the hills were. Next please. Okay, this is the map we saw before of the Boston Common and the Boston Public Garden, um, which was a piece of urban land reclamation. And let's look at the next slide, please. Because of these, these long, thin buildings. This is a map from 1814 of what was happening in the area which became the Public Garden. These are rope walks. Do people here know what rope walks are? Probably not. Oh, you do, yes, okay. Rope walks are things you need in maritime economies. You need a lot of rope to operate ships. Boston is full of ships because what we do best is trading, getting things from one place to another. Boston is not a place that grows rice or tobacco or sugar or pineapples, but we are good at getting things from one place to another and processing things. We don't have any sugar cane, but we make run. We need ships to get things from place to place. How do you make rope? in a time before there are any mills in Lowell, before there are factories. What you have is a long, thin building, kind of like these pews, but a little bit thicker. And you twist fibers together and you walk and walk and walk backwards, twisting your fibers together until you get a really long rope, as long as you're building. And then to keep the ends together, you dip them in a bucket of hot tar in a long, narrow, windowless, wooden building. Rope walks are fire traps. And in 1794, rope walks that were on the other side of the city in Fort Hill, kind of near where Faneuil Hall is now, burnt down and took a good chunk of Boston with them. And the city fathers of Boston realized we need rope, we don't really want to burn down more of Boston, gave the rope walk makers this land at the bottom of the Boston Common. Said, go ahead, take these mud flats, fill them in, you can have as much land as you want, just put your rope walks over there, you won't bother anyone. Again, it's the Charles River side of Boston. No big ships, no big traders. There are buildings, but not as many. Boston Common, if it catches on fire, it's not gonna burn down that many buildings. 
1806, the rope walks burned down again. And in 1819, they burned down another time. And after having three fires, the city fathers of Boston finally said, go take your rope walks to the suburbs, please. And they bought the land back from the rope walkers, which leads you to wonder if the rope walk makers made more money by making and selling rope or by selling their land to the city of Boston. I don't know. But they decamped and they left this filled in area just sitting there at the base of the Boston Common, which people were, began to have some pride in. You know, this is where our forefathers died in the American Revolution. This was not where the Liberty Tree actually was, but you know, something that harkened back to our past. Remember the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, 1826, people were starting to think about historical preservation. Um, by 1830, people were getting so disgusted by the mudflats around the uh, public garden that they filled in a lot of area and in proper Bostonian fashion just left it there. Nobody knew what to do with this patch of land. Everybody thought it should be a park because it was next to the Boston Common, this hollowed land, but nobody wanted to spend money making a park. Nobody could decide what to do until in 1837, Horace Gray, no relation to Asa Gray, the botanist, as far as I know, and 17 of his best friends in the whole wide world decided to set up a park themselves. They were wealthy men, they were gentlemen, and they wanted to make a refined place that would show Boston's true, true stature, how it belonged in the world. And they decided what Boston needed on this patch of land, more than anything else you could make, was a botanic garden. This is not the way millionaires tend to think nowadays. You don't hear about the Gates Foundation Botanic Garden, or you know Don Chiafaro is not exactly planting a botanic garden on the Greenway. But it was back then. 1838 was when the Massachusetts Horticultural Society was founded. This is an era when cultivated and cultured people did things like create new varieties of pears or import grapes from Hampstead Court and put them over in the Lyman Estate in Waltham. Creating new horticultural objects was a sign that you were concerned about your republic that you were willing to contribute to the material culture and health and well-being of your fellow citizens by developing new pears, not apples, because you made hard cider out of apples, and that was kind of you know, not so great. So they set up a conservatory and an aviary on the Boston Public Garden. They planted some of the first public tulips in America. Now, this is the one mistake I may have mentioned earlier in my book. I do claim that the first tulips in America were planted in the public garden, but I talked to Isla Cox, who is a tulip historian nearby, and it turns out that, as you might suspect, Dutch settlers on, uh, in New York State planted tulips in their yards in the 1600s. Of course they did. Of course Dutch people bring tulips to America. What was I thinking? But still, they were much admired. There were peacocks strolling around the grounds. It was a lovely place until perhaps in a sort of reincarnation of its previous state, the aviary burned down too. And then Mr. Gray and his friends lost all their money in various bank failures. And again, the piece of land was left to sit until 1854 when the city of Boston finally said, sorry, 1852, when the city of Boston finally said, oh, all right, I guess we'll maintain a park here and had it redesigned and has pretty much maintained it in high Victorian style ever since. Yes, please. Uh, next, please. Next, please. And here's what it looked like in 1860. One thing to look at here, um, the kind woman who introduced me talked a little bit about how parks evolve and change. One thing I like to look at in old pictures of parks is how big the trees were and how things looked. Because when you go to the public garden now, what you see are things like there's a 150-year-old Amur cork tree, there's a 100-foot-tall Don Redwood. You see all these shady places. And in 1860, that wasn't shady. It was really open and sunny. Next, please. And they didn't even have swan boats. You know, how, what, what a tragedy it was to be in the Boston Public Garden in 1869. Very popular, no swan boats. Next, please. And here's another picture from the 1860s. Again, it's so sunny you have to carry a parasol to keep yourself from getting sunstroke. Lots of rose bushes, short trees. It looks and feels different than it does now. Next, please. And Finally, the swans arrive, migration is over, and more tulips that we still have today. Next, please. This is just a map of what Boston looked like in 1852, where uh, it says Western Avenue at the top there. That's the Nil Dam that was blocking all this area from having the tides scour out yucky stuff around its banks. 
Um, we already talked a little bit about why the back bay was filled in to make more land, more area. Next, please. And part of making that particular area of Boston suitable for people to have fine houses was having a park in the middle of it, a proper Parisian boulevard. This was modeled after the boulevards of Paris. It's long, it's straight, it has very formal walking paths. You know, it doesn't look like a place where you go and play frisbee. It's a place where you're supposed to promenade and stroll and observe the carefully constructed houses with mansard roofs, also very popular in Paris at the time, and, and feel proper. And another thing to look at here again is these trees are short. Next, please. Same Alexander Hamilton statue. These trees are tall. It's gone from being a sunny promenade to a shaded enclosed space over the course of the last 150 years. Um, several of these trees have been replaced over time. They have to be. Trees are living. That's another problem when you're thinking about parks. When people think of public monuments, public spaces, historic spaces, you think of buildings, things that once you put them up, they pretty much stay the same. I mean, wood needs to be maintained, stones need to be maintained. But when you think of the Bunker Hill Monument, when you think of this church, when you think of the Pyramid of Cheops, you can imagine something staying there, pretty much the same shape. You know, you can remake wood to be pretty much the same shape to go on the top of these pews. You can't do that with parks. When a tree gets sick and dies, you have a hole, and it's very hard to get another tree that's 30 feet tall to replace these. This is one reason why the good citizens of Beacon Hill are so <sighs> concerned about the elms in the Boston Common, in Boston Public Garden, because Dutch elm disease is here. And they spend a lot of time injecting them with fungicides, because once those elms are gone, it will take a good 50 years to grow something else that size in their pace. You know, bless them for their energy. Um, parks change because they're living things. They're living organisms that we have to maintain. And we have to rethink the design when they fall down. The microburst we had last year, which felled trees in the common and public garden, you have to think, what can I put here? How will this change the park over time? Next, please. Um, this is just an illustration of the Back Bay Fens. So we've gone from the Boston Common, Boston Public Garden, connected via Commonwealth Avenue, and now we're coming to kind of a different era in Boston parks, a very creative era. Back Bay Fens. You're talking about an area, again, wet meadow, um, lots of open, very shallow water. Again, a place where you're have wet meadow where you have tides come in every so often, a place where people have been gradually filling in bit by bit that's prone to a lot of flooding as people try to put the Muddy River and the Stony Brook into channels. In 1878, Boston decided that what they needed to deal with all this flooding and contain this was to put up some kind of park because you couldn't use this easily flooded land for much of anything else. And they held a competition for, to design this park. And it was won by a man named Herman Grundle who has had a great disservice done to him by some rather prejudiced historians because on his application to build this park, he wrote his profession was florist. Now, Herman Grundle had previously year, in the previous year, designed Foss Park in Somerville to great acclaim. There was lots of celebration. He made a beautiful park with a water feature, but he didn't put that on his application. So people reading it afterwards thought, oh, well, it was just a florist designing this park. And that was why Boston ignored his design because Herman Grundle's design is not what you see in the back bay right now. What happened is that Grundle won the competition, and a person who had been consulting to the Boston Parks Department came up and said, oh, what a lovely design. Tell me, what does it do about your flooding problem? And the good city fathers of Boston looked and said, well, it doesn't really do anything about flooding. Uh, are parks supposed to do that? It looks like a pretty park. And the consultant said, I can build you a park that will be beautiful and control your flooding. And the Boston City Father said, all right, Mr. Olmsted, we'll let you take over this project. Frederick Law Olmsted, designer of Central Park, a uh, brilliant man, never went to college. He had problems with his eyes. He'd had um, an illness which would take away much of his sight. Um, author, traveler, one-time farmer, uh, reporter on the South before the Civil War, came up with the idea of building an artificial salt marsh in the Back Bay Fence, something that had never existed there before, with narrow channels, a meandering oxbow of river going through in what was basically just a big open mudflat. Next, please. 
This isn't quite Olmsted's design because a couple of these areas have been filled in since Olmsted designed it. That's another secret of Boston is that we've already filled in parks before. We've actually completely destroyed a park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this area over here, is this location of um, a playground was filled in. This area was filled in from some of the dirt excavating the Boylston Street subway around 1910. But you can see, in contrast, could you go back for just a moment? We went from something that looked kind of like this to, next please, this. Oxbows, curving, not much open water area. Next please. Olmsted designed an artificial salt marsh. He designed a place with sloping banks so that when the river rose, it would rise gradually instead of hitting a wall and scouring down. You may have seen this during flooding, perhaps even in your own home. Um, he designed it with little islands in the middle. He planted salt-tolerant species of grasses and flowers. Next, please. And he designed large vistas, and it was very beautiful. And you can see this man thought it was so lovely he had to wear his nice formal hat. Uh, it's changed over the past 100 years, partly because the Charles River got dammed in 1910. It went from being a river that was tidal with salt water to being fresh. And all of those wonderful seaside lavender, seaside goldenrod, salt-tolerant plants that Frederick Law Olmsted planted died. Then Storo Drive was built over the grand entrance to his park, and something called the Esplanade was put in a little bit uh, farther beyond that entrance. Next, please. And something else happened here. Um, these are what are called Phragmites reeds. They don't grow in salt water. They grow in the fresh water. They grow about yay high. And what they do is block your view and block access to things. Um, you saw before that gentleman looking out over that wide vista. When you have Phragmites reeds, you don't get the vista. You get a wall. And when you have walls, people can hide, which means that people can get nervous being there because they don't know who's out there. And people who want to do something they have to hide start hanging out there. I remember when I moved to Boston way back when, after I was 16, I was told, you know, you didn't want to hang around the back bay fence at night. People did stuff back in those reeds. You don't want to know about it. Change the feeling of the park. Change the idea of who belonged there, what you could do there, whether or not it was safe. Now, the Muddy River Restoration Project is supposed to be dredging the bottom of the park and taking out those Phragmites over the next few years. Um, and that should change how it feels again. But it will never be what Olmsted designed because it's a completely different environment. It's fresh water now. What do you do with that? Next, please. Uh, this is just a picture of Jamaica Pond. This is what it looked like back then. Next, please. This is what it looks like now. Fredericksville Olmsted didn't do much to it. It was already sort of a pleasure area of Boston. He didn't move any earth around, which is not what he did in the other places. Let's go. OK. This is the open grave section of this. Um, we're gonna, we've gone around the Emerald Necklace. We're going to take a moment out to Mount Auburn and Forest Hill Cemetery. By 1810, there were editorials about the sad state of Boston cemeteries in Boston newspapers, where commonly you would have graves left open until you had enough bodies to justify filling it, especially in the winter when the ground is hard to dig. You're talking about one, two, three, four bodies being put in a grave. So the good fathers of Boston decided we needed to have cemeteries a bit further away where there was a little bit more space. Next, please. At the same time, you had transcendentalist ideas coming into vogue. Idea that you should be close to nature to be closer to God. I'm going to read this very brief paragraph by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. Timothy Leary in the 1830s, ladies and gentlemen. Next, please. Nature was something that was going to comfort you, was that play to contact the oversoul God. But the problem is there wasn't any nature left in Massachusetts, or at least eastern Massachusetts at that point, or at least not much. Uh, but Massachusetts was being rapidly deforested between 1800 and 1850. You went from 50% tree cover in the state to 25% by 1850. Boston had switched from using wood for heating to coal by 1840. And in fact, if you look at some pictures of filling in of the public garden, there's a uh, lithograph by Winslow Homer showing people 
you know, sorting through coal ashes that were dumped there to fill it in. Uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery is a beautiful place, copied after the Garden Cemetery Père Lachaise in France, much like the Back Bay. Uh, sorry, the Commonwealth Avenue Mall was copied after lovely French streets. But it's not nature. You know, when you talk about contact with nature, Ralph Waldo Emerson wasn't encountering very much nature in Concord. That had been farmed for over 150 years, used as a woodlot too. And Mount Auburn also isn't nature. It's a place that was planted and pruned and designed to resemble the sort of nature that people thought would heal you. Next, please. And this is a little bit of what it looked like. This is supposedly a picture from 1834. Mount Auburn was opened in 1831. Uh, one thing to note here, apart from the trees, is that there is a fence around this gravesite. So nobody else's bodies will be put in without your consent. You know, it's walled off. It's private, unlike those open graves in Boston. Next, please. Here's what Mount Auburn looks like today, one of the premier birding destinations in Boston. Um, Mount Auburn has been very progressive about their ecological landscaping, keeping all materials on site, keeping storm water, and keep on talking about storm water, from getting off site, um, and trying to incorporate more New England native grasses and plants in their designs. Um, again, it's a historic cemetery, but it's living. They have to keep rethinking what they do with plants because they're specimen trees. Some of them have died by now. They've planted new ones. How do you keep thinking about a garden, about a park, being historically accurate, but trying to be more ecologically responsible, trying to deal with changing times? Next, please. This is just a, a couple of pictures from Forest Hill Cemetery where you can rest in peace. Um, I like this picture on the right because it shows how far Victorians diverge from this idea of nature healing you. This is one of the least natural floral arrangements I've seen in my life. Perfect Victorian carpet bedding. Longs a wedding cake, but again, appropriate for a cemetery healing through the beauty of it all. This was beautiful. It may be beautiful to you. Next, please. Um, Franklin Park. I realize we're running out of time. I will speak very quickly. Well, no, I will speak so you can hear me, but include less information. Um, Franklin Park begun in, I don't have the exact date here, do I? 1880s is what we're talking about in terms of when it was planned. Um, again, by Frederick Law Olmsted, the genius that brought us the Back Bay Fens, but with a very different goal in mind. This was similar to the goals of Mount Auburn and Forest Hills Cemetery, the idea that you needed a park within pretty easy travel distance of the city because cities ruin people. Cities make their people nervous. They have dust and noise and animals and too many people around. They will break you down. They will ruin your health. And the only way, according to Frederick Law Olmsted, to heal people is to provide a nice natural park. And that will, will lift their spirits. It will heal their bodies and minds. He wrote an entire book called Notes and a Plan for Franklin Park to explain this to people in excruciating detail and length. Next, please. And this is what was supposed to heal you. A nice pastoral landscape, similar to those that Olmsted had visited earlier in the 19th century in England on the old English estates. Pastoral scenes, not the sort of nature of creeping forests like you have in Mount Auburn or Forest Hills, but open plains with sheep dotted with trees, somewhere you could stroll gently. Not play sports. You weren't supposed to, supposed to play ball here. Olmsted forced Boston to buy an entire separate park right next to Franklin Park to give people a place to play ball so they wouldn't be in this park. It's known as Harrenby Park today. Um, you may have heard about it over the summer where there was a tragic shooting because people hang out there. It's an extremely popular place, lots of basketball, places to play all kinds of games and sports there. And um, unfortunately for Frederick Law Olmsted, more Bostonians supported the Harem B. Park idea than Franklin. Next, please. And shortly after Franklin Park opened, people started doing things like playing tennis. Uh, within 20 years, everything that Frederick Law Olmsted opposed in the park, like a zoo and golf courses and things, were installed in the park. The park didn't belong to Olmsted, it belonged to the citizens of Boston. People's ideas of what to do changed, and the park changed. These are not static places. They change and grow, and people's ideas of what to do in a park have changed. You know, there's so many arguments nowadays about dogs, dog parks. What are those dogs doing in our park? You shouldn't let them off leaps. Well, you know, there were similar arguments about ball playing 100 years ago. People's ideas of what they need to do outside have changed, and whether or not we can deal with it appropriately depends on us. 
you know, but they aren't going away. People have ideas of what to do in parks. Next, please. Um, I'm just going to finish up here with a couple of pictures of the Esplanade. Um, these are children in the West End exercising. Esplanade originally parkland was set aside in that end of Boston's for public health for the children who needed space to exercise and grow. Um, the Charles River Basin was visualized, envisioned rather, by a brilliant man named Charles Elliott who died young in the 1870s but was part of the original Metropolitan District Commission. And he envisioned amazing things about Boston. He's the guy who gave us the Great Blue Hills, the Middlesex Fells, and the Charles River Basin. At a time when the Charles River was industrial, we had things like oh, tanning factories and all sorts of things that used the river to dump their refuse in way up in Watertown. He saw that this could be a place where Bostonians celebrated, where people could have pleasure looking at their city. And it was his idea that the Charles River be dammed. This was taken up by a certain John Jackson Storrow, who as former captain of the Harvard crew team had an interest in the Charles River's condition. They may have experienced it at far too close hand. Next, please. So in 1910, the Charles River was dammed, and all of Frederick Law Olmsted's plants died in the Back Bay fence. And they set up a seawall and suddenly had this lovely pleasure basin for boating, except there was a problem. You see that wall? See how it's straight up and down? When water would lap against the wall, it would sort of push against it, and there would be force. It wouldn't just rise gradually like it would on those nice sloping islands of the Back Bay Fens. It would strike it and be put down. So if you tried to boat there, your boat would get slammed against the side of the river and break, and you might get thrown into the river. It was not very popular for boating. Also, there's um, something missing here, like trees, shrubs, flowers, anything. It was pretty much this barren, windy wasteland next to the back bay until Mr. Storrow died. Oh, here's another picture from the early years of the Esplanade, um, Esplanade playground equipment, which um, I like because it shows the difference between today's playground equipment and the playground equipment of yesteryear. Do you see any safety bars here? What happens if you fall off that, huh? <laughs> you break your arm or your leg or worse. You know That's probably why there are all these older kids hanging out in the playground because they're saying, <laughs> what, who's going to fall down next? You know, Bet your quarter on that guy. Um, 1932, John Jackson Starrow drives, and his bereaved widow gives Boston a million dollars to make the Esplanade better. And they do. They plant thousands of trees, and it becomes something more like what we have now. 1950s, Helen Starrow has the misfortune of dying, whereupon Boston does what it always wanted to do, which is put a highway through the Esplanade. But they do add another 40 acres of lagoons and islands at that point, dredged from the bottom of the Charles River. Next, please. Oh, is there more to this? Next. OK. And we are running out of time. So let me just go to part three very briefly, and then I'll let you go. OK, next. Next. There we go. Next. 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 OK. Common was a fine place for cows. Next, please. Uh, hangings. One of the f reasons we have the Boston Common, why it survived so long, is it was a great, one of the few large open spaces in Boston, a place where you could have a really big gathering. This was the gathering for the hanging of Mary Barrett Dyer, who had the misfortune of being a, a Quaker in Puritan Boston. Uh, her statue is outside the State House now. Uh, maybe Mr. Blackston had a good idea in decamping for Providence. Next, please. This is the public gathering when Boston uh, got its public water supply in 1848 hooked up to Lake Kachichuit in Natick, which apparently, before it became Boston's public water supply, was called Long Pond, but acquired a more decorative, native-sounding name when it became Boston's water supply. Next, please. Yeah, people fought stuff. Next, please. Um, this is just another view of it. Again, short trees, lots of open space. Next, please. So we talked a little bit about Bostonians building parks before 1900. Boston Common was useful. The public garden was urban land reclamation from you know, mud flats taken over by the rope walk makers. Uh, Commonwealth Avenue Mall looked spiffy. The Back Bay Fens managed water. The Jamaica Pond and Franklin Park were part of public health. We didn't talk about the Arnold Arboretum, but Harvard needed trees. Um, Forest Hills and Mount Auburn were to help people heal from mourning, but also great places for tourism. You'll find it all sorts of guides to Boston from 1850 and 1860. Next, please. Um, Parks today are made for a lot of different reasons. Next, please. Recreation. If you're building a park now, you have to find some place to put it. You can't just fill in land. 
So Piers Park was built an abandoned pier. John Paul II Park is on an old landfill and an auto body shop site they used to have. Next, please. Some parks are made as art. Taylor Square in Cambridge is about the size of one of these pews. An artist sent out 5,000 keys to people in Cambridge a few years ago and said, here's the key to your park. It looks like a park. It has grass. Um, Arts on the Point is part of UMass Boston. They have, that's a, that sculpture is about as tall as this room, Roy Lichtenstein, right before the Boston Harbor. Um, artists put on the landscape. Next, please. People produce food. This is the story of the Fenway Victory Gardens and also the South End Gardens of Boston Natural Area Network. South End Gardens, there was urban renewal in Boston. Remember in the 1960s, we were supposed to have the Inner Belt Project, another highway through here, resisted by people in the South End, but not before. Boston already torn down dozens, hundreds of buildings. Empty, vacant lots. What do you do with them? Well, if you live in South Boston, you reclaim them in the South End and you start planting vegetables there because there aren't any supermarkets that sell the food you want from wherever you grew up in Asia or Africa. And we have community gardens because of that, because of those people dealing with urban renewal. Next, please. There are memorial gardens, much like Mount Auburn nowadays. On the left is the Garden of Peace, right up behind Government Center. That river of stones looks like water passing by. Each of those stones is inscribed with the name of a victim of homicide. There are some very famous names there. I found Matthew Epen, the boy who was shaken to death in Brookline. On the right is the Garden of Hope for cancer survivors. Um, I don't know if it's coming back to Government Center this year. I tried to contact the management, and they didn't respond to me. But again, it's for people who are surviving cancer. Next, please. This is a healing garden on the eighth floor of the Yawkey Center, Mass General Hospital. Designed for people undergoing cancer treatment, there are no scented flowers up there, so it won't trigger nausea. You look out over the Charles. It's a beautiful place. Next, please. Public mitigation requirements. Eastport Park was built by Fidelity when they built a large building, and Boston said, you have to give something back to the public. And they said, here, have a park. A few years later, this sculpture, site-specific, was the subject of a lawsuit. Fidelity tried to remove it. The sculptor who had made it, David Phillips, said, this sculpture is site-specific. If you remove it, you are destroying my work. You can't do that. Four years later, Fidelity won the lawsuit, but didn't remove the sculpture anyway. I don't understand large corporations. Next, please. Some parks express local identity. Chinatown Park, just around the corner from here, built with a lot of consultation for local community, has a lot of reflections of people who live in Chinatown, a lot of references to Asian plants. You got your bamboo and your ginkgos and azaleas, and a lot of references to the ocean of people coming over in ships, lots of waves, scale, um, tiles on the ground. They're supposed to look like dragon scales. Next, please. Places to dump the dirt. OK. Half the Big Dig Dirt went to Spectacle Island, the Big Dig Dirt. Half of it went here to Millennium Park off the FW's Parkway. Um, it's actually almost those colors in real nature. It's mown every year to maintain it as wildflowers, lots of seeds from all those flowers, lots of birds. It's an amazing place for bird watching. And there's a porta potty at the top of this enormous mound of dirt. Next, please. Preserving habitat, not a priority for our Puritan ancestors, a priority for us now. This is Ellendale Woods, JP. It's across the street from the Arnold Arboretum, but hard to find. Aren't any big signs saying, come to me, but it's 90 acres. It's a second growth oak hickory forest. There's almost nobody there. Um, the Trails were just renovated in 2009. There are wild blueberries growing back there. I think everybody should go to this place sooner or later. Next, please. Creating habitat. This was a parking lot 10 years ago. This is Rambler Park, built between uh, 2001 and 2005. No, it was first planned in 1999, ended in 2004. Half acre next to the fence, planted with Again, plants that provide seeds for word, birds. Rudbeckia, echinacea, they have sweet gum and pine trees that provide food and shelter. Um, it's a gorgeous little park. And who would have planted bird food in 1630 in Boston? Again, this is a very new idea that we are creating habitat. The John Paul II Park I showed you a moment ago created habitat, placing a new place for animals. Next, please. Green roofs. This is the Children's Museum. We're plant, we have run out of space. We're putting plants on tops of roofs now because we don't have enough space for them. This is also about water management, about keeping water from coming off of the roof during rainstorms and going into your sewers, going into your harbor, sweeping pollution off of the roadways. 
Green roofs keep the water from going in at peak times. It helps prevent flooding. Next, please. Legacy of the Rich. Thank you, Isabella. Ms. Gardner, Mrs. Gardner, pardon me, for giving us a beautiful courtyard. I don't have the picture of the new greenhouse at the Gardner Museum yet, um, but there are many gardens, particularly ones belonging to the trustees of reservations, which are here now because someone decided they didn't trust their children or their relatives with their estate, and they donated it to some place like the trustees reservations, the Audubon Society, to be maintained as a beautiful garden after their death. Um, this is Sedgwick's Gardens at Long Hill in Beverly. And um, it's interesting, this idea of maintaining the beauty and the, the tension there is between dealing again with a living, growing area while um, carrying out someone's wishes in perpetuity. This is the problem with the Longfellow House Garden, which was renewed as a colonial revival garden a few years ago, which was taken back to one of its versions since it was found in 1870. They took it back to the 1920s version as opposed to the 1910 version or the 1872 version. Um, but it's beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful garden if you get to the Longfellow House. And um, I enjoy going to all these places and I've enjoyed speaking into this evening. And please feel free to come forward if you have any questions or want to buy a book. Thank you very much for listening.